Hey guys, welcome back to Brian's Mysteries and Adventures on Trail. I hope everybody is having a good holiday season so far. So today's case is going to take us down to Antarctica and we are going to be talking about two different cases. One, a disappearance that took place in 1965 and then a very mysterious death of an astrophysicist that took place in 2000. Now Antarctica is basically at the bottom of this beautiful blue marble that we all live on. So this would be the Earth looking at it from this way, and then this is where Antarctica is for reference. Now, back in the late 50s, a joint Army Air Force Marines force went down there to create this base, and they created a base with four prefabricated buildings, and it lasted a few years, but basically under the huge winds and snow, they had to rebuild it and basically this was set up for different scientific studies and different uh, you know, military operations and this is what they called Bird Station. The station went through various upgrades and rebuilds over the years but eventually in late 2004 it was abandoned. So that is the history of the station. We are going to be going back to 1965 and down in the Antarctic it is very different than something like this is what we would probably see on a snowy day. But for the most part Antarctica is it's uninhabitable. I mean the people that are living there are scientists or military people and doing various scientific research. And this guy by the name of Carl Robert Dish, he was working for the National Bureau of Standards Scientists. And he was down there, he was only 26 years old, and he was working at this bird station. Now, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology is a physical sciences laboratory and non-regulatory agencies of the United States Department of Commerce commerce excuse me and its mission is basically to promote innovation and various like competitiveness they do various research and all kinds of projects around the world and Carl Dish was an ionospheric physicist who was stationed at the radio noise building of Bird Station to work on various ionospheric studies and basically this all started on the morning of May 8th, 1965. There was a regular route that he would take between the radio noise building and the main station complex, which was roughly 7,000 feet away or 2,100 meters. Based on the official report that was documented, Dish departed the radio noise building to head to this main complex at around 9.15 a.m. And this building is south of the radio noise building and there's actually a hand line that runs from the meteorology building at the main station to the ladder at the base of the radio noise building. Because it basically like that down there without any light, it's very just easy to get lost. I mean, it's everything looks the same. It's all white. And so when he had not arrived back by an hour later, they sent out uh, vehicles by for a search party and they did have snowmobiles and things like that. And at around 11.30 a.m., his trail was picked up leading west of Bird Station. It led to the southwest corner of the Skyway, a distance of about four miles. But unfortunately, at this point, the search party had to turn around because they needed more fuel. And when they returned to where they had found the footprints, they spent three hours trying to re-pick up the trail. But because the winds were so high... They were reported to be roughly 30 miles an hour. And by the way, the temperature was reported to be minus 75 degrees Fahrenheit, which is just, I can't even imagine that. But unfortunately, all this had covered the drifting snow, had covered the tracks that Carl had made. And unfortunately, it was starting to cover all the search party's tracks, which was making their possible safe return to Bird Station very dangerous. So unfortunately, they had to return. And then at around 7 p.m., another search party was sent out to investigate the area of the supply line and where they thought he may have gone. They didn't find anything and then again around uh, 8 o'clock they were able to get more people and they basically made a human chain from the dump area to the end of the skyway just ensuring that nobody else would get lost and they started f firing flares every half hour from this aurora tower and they put on all the floodlights that they had basically because the visibility with the blowing snow and the darkness it was 
basically zero visibility. And they said that because the visibility conditions were so bad that the, even the flares weren't being helpful, so they stopped using them. They sent out another vehicle search party at roughly 6 p.m. on May 9th, and it covered a one mile by nine mile long area of south of the Skyway. They found occasional tracks and followed them about four miles south of the station, where unfortunately they again disappeared. But they did notice that there was no noticeable shortening of the stride in the track, so it didn't look like he was injured or anything like that. And it's also noteworthy to mention that he had traveled this route between the main complex and the radio noise building, be doing various scientific studies more than 25 times just that season alone. So they were a little bit confused as to how he if he got lost or what could have possibly happened because this was something that he was very familiar with. They sent out an eight-man search party equipped with two vehicles, a James Way, and sufficient fuel and provisions to last a week, which departed the stage, the main station at roughly 740 on May 10th. And they went on a southerly track and they searched over 12 miles south of the station. They marked it with various trail uh, flags and other things. They didn't find any tracks. Then on May 12th, they searched the northeast and southeast sections of the bird station. But unfortunately, the visibility uh, got really bad with all the darkness and sort of limited their abilities. The next two days that they reported the visibility was so poor due to the blowing snow and fog that they couldn't even go out and search. They did know that Carl was clothed in the Antarctic clothing. He was properly dressed. And during the main part of the search, the temperature was around minus 44 degrees Fahrenheit with a 30 mile an hour wind. Now, the tracks that they found, they said that they indicated that he didn't contact the hand line, which started at the ladder of the radio noise building, but headed in a direction downwind, which again, they found to be very bizarre. And unfortunately, due to the length of time that Carl had been missing and the length of time in the exposure of the Antarctic winter, that combined with throughout this whole period, there was various blizzards with winds up to 45 knots, visibility reduced to zero with all the blowing snow. And of course, you have the seasonal darkness, which basically makes it overcast. And they said at one point, the temperature was literally minus 80 below, which is really, I mean, that prevents even the strongest of men to move and move their vehicles. The report says that all they could really do was utilize the brief twilight at midday and the light of the full moon whenever possible to search for Carl. But unfortunately, due to the time he was missing and all the, the various factors, the Antarctic winter, the darkness, they just presumed that he had passed. And unfortunately, they never found him. I mean, he still remains missing to this day. He has never been found. And of course, over the years, there's been various conspiracies you know someone said that he once called the radio tower and said hi i'm carl i'm okay uh, some people believe that he just walked off to start a new life which is you know just ridiculous i mean where are you going to go it's antarctica <laughs> so but unfortunately it's just one of those you know enduring mysteries what happened to him why did he go off course he was a very smart man i mean he was a physicist who had done this route many times and it's possible he just got disoriented in the darkness and the snow and sadly i think the world was robbed of what was a, a very promising career this man was very smart he had only just joined the boulder laboratory staff the year before and he was said to be a very intelligent young man who took his work very seriously and who knows what kind of contributions he could have made to society. And, you know, it's just a tragedy all around. Now, they did have memorial services for him back in his hometown of Monroe, Wisconsin, on May 14th of that year. And but he still does remain, a, you know, a missing person. They unfortunately never found him. And my thoughts and prayers go out to him and his family and everyone who knew him. I can't imagine how bizarre and unsettling this whole thing was. Not only the loss, but, you know, just to never have any real true answers. And my thoughts and prayers go out to any of his relatives and anybody that might have known him and all those people that work so hard and dedicate themselves to these kind of scientific explorations that are very dangerous. Now, our next case is also takes place in the South Pole, but this takes place at the Amundsen Scott base in 2000. Now, this is a very, very bizarre case. There's not a lot of information, 
But this station was actually built at roughly the same time in the late 50s as part of the United States Scientific Research Project and just trying to expand their um, reach into different areas. It was built by the Navy Seabees and the federal government of the United States. Actually, the first one was built in 1956, and it still remains in operation, and it is the southernmost point under the jurisdiction of the United States, and it is administered by the Officer of Polar Programs of the National Science Foundation. So anyway, there was a scientist down there working as an astrophysicist, and his name was Rodney Marks, and he was working there in 2000 and one day he just fell really really ill and he eventually passed away and they had no idea what had happened his body was put in what they call storage so i'm guessing some kind of freezer it wasn't until months later that apparently there's a lot of jurisdictional stuff with this south pole region a lot of it falls under new zealand so it wasn't until six months later that he was actually flown to new zealand for an autopsy and this is due to apparently most of the american operations fall within this ross dependency territory claimed by new zealand where all the supplies are dispatched the U.S. government does not accept New Zealand's claim on this territory of sovereignty. So anyway, anytime something happens, there's a lot of delays. And his remains were literally held for six months over the winter before they could be flown to Christchurch, New Zealand, which was the base for American activities in, in Antarctica. And that is where they performed the autopsy. Now, once they did this, they had determined that he had died from methanol poisoning. So both the United States and Australia agreed to what the coroner said, and they started an investigation, which was undertaken by this guy named Grant Warmald of the New Zealand police. And they basically said that there was no way that Mark deliberately ingested this methanol. They said that it was obviously something that somebody put in it. He would never have drank it um, knowingly. Mark had recently entered a new relationship and had nearly completed uh, very important academic work. He had no financial problems. He had no reason to purposely ingest this. So they had all determined that this was a homicide. They knew that the methanol was being used on the base as a cleaning agent. So this guy, Ormald, he was under the impression that someone had put this in his drink. And he tried to get in touch with various people at the base. He said that they were very uncooperative. He said the Rathian and National Science Foundation wasn't cooperative with him. He finally obtained details from 49 other people that were on the base. But in total, I believe it was around 150 people that were actually living there. And apparently the Department of Justice also failed to obtain answers from the two various organizations that were denied basically because of the jurisdiction. Then in December of 2006, the coroner reconvened the investigation and the results were widely reported. So it was given more attention. And obviously Mark's family was very grateful for the New Zealand police that they had really were focusing on this. And it was such a, what he called an arduous task of dealing with people that quite obviously don't want to deal with them. Then in January of 2007, seven years after his passing, the case was again on the front page news News in New Zealand when documents obtained under the Americans Freedom of Information Act suggested quote diplomatic heat was brought to bear on the New Zealand inquiry then in September of 2008 a report was written resulting from the 2006 inquest that the coroner could not find evidence to support the theories of a prank gone wrong or a foul play nor suicide you know, it was just, this has just been one of those cases that's been so frustrating for all the investigators and people trying to find justice for Mark. You know, the cause of this methanol poisoning has never been determined. And of course, Mark family has not given up hope. I mean, they, it's hard because it's been so many years, but it's, his father is quoted as saying, as I don't think we are ever going to find any more in regards to how Rodney died. And I just think that's so sad because... Here, this young guy had his whole life ahead of him. And according to what the New Zealand reports say that like, you know, when they got there to do inquiries, all the men and women who had been working there had already dispersed and they were very difficult. They put up a wall of silence. Mark was described as highly intelligent, 
but he was also to have said to have um, somewhat of a Tourette syndrome and perhaps made him a candidate for angering someone during their, you know, this agonizing winter during, you know, secluded on this little base. According to reports and people that have lived in these type of situations, living in that close proximity with the same people day after day in these terrible, these really harsh conditions has been known to get the better of people. And there was an example of two men in 2007 who got into a, a drunken brawl and had to be evacuated because one of them uh, broke his jaw. And, you know, the report says that we're probably unlikely to ever know what really happened in Mark's case. Um, you know, his room was clean, potential evidence was thrown away, and, you know, the findings of the U.S. agencies have never been released. And, you know, there was so much time that, was, that went by between when he passed and when the autopsy was done, and who knows what they could have done down there on the base. So it's just one of those tragic mysteries and my heart goes out to him and his family and everyone who knew him and hopefully one day he will get justice but you know it's been over 20 years now and i know the new zealand police still have it as an open investigation but with that amount of time and you know so few people down there the snow and wind and blowing snow and i mean it was pretty much the investigation was botched from the beginning unfortunately and unfortunately when there's all this jurisdictional stuff things really do tend to get lost in the mix and just unfortunate and you know, hopefully one day he will get justice, though. My thoughts and prayers go out to the families of both these men and everyone who's worked on their cases and everyone who's tried to help. I want to thank everybody for watching, as always, and please be respectful in the comments if you choose to leave them. Special thank you to co.ag for providing the background music, and I'll see everybody in the next one. Take care. Hey everyone, thanks for sticking with me to the end. And I just wanted to clarify, I just sent the Christmas cards out yesterday or today, so no one's gotten one. And like I said, the only people I really could send them to were people I had their addresses for. There was a lot of people I wanted to send, but I didn't have your address. Next year, I'll have a better way of doing it. I still have some calendars left if anyone's interested in them. Thank you for everybody that has subscribed and for bearing with me while I'm sick. And for all your support, I appreciate it so much. And if you have any case suggestions or anything for me, please email me or leave me a comment. I hope everybody's having a wonderful holiday and just wishing you all the best and happy holiday wishes.